Well, my personality of the week is no other than the lawmaker, Dino Melaye, who earlier in the week decided to pitch camp with the PDP. Is my man of the week because, in a sense, he has given us a foretaste of what is going to come later in Nigerian politics in probably the third quarter of this year, where PNPDP will start to show its color. And maybe it's just telling us where its mentor is heading, or maybe it is also telling us what the mentor asked him to do. We're talking of uh, Bukola Saraki, uh, a.k.a. Elaine. What is plotting to do and send him forward to say, okay, let us see how they will react to this move. So the drama is beginning and we give Dino Melai the kudos for giving us a little peephole into what is to come. I had an interesting conversation with the governor of Cross River State, Professor Ben Ayade. That is coming up next on The Big Talk. Welcome to Big Talk. I have a special guest today, and no other than Professor Ayade, the governor of Cross River State. Welcome to this show. Thank you so very much. Well, um, how would you sum up three years in office? I'd like to sum it up by first saying, I give God the grace I give all the glory to God for keeping us alive to see my third year anniversary. And also very importantly to thank the people of Cross River State and to say in summary, I understand the challenges of my people, addressing and focusing on their needs. And in three years, I have done what I think I can to ensure that I reduce tension and poverty in the state. Well, as, as quite brief. You had one and a half years to battle in court. How did that affect your capacity to operate as a governor? Well, uh, sadly, it's almost a tradition in Nigeria that once after election, you have a year or two to go in court, whether the point is valid or not valid. As a lawyer myself, I was very sure that I had no reasons to be in the court. But unfortunately, it has become an ordeal that every politician goes through. And it just shows the backwardness of our times. And as a country, uh, we've just come to a tradition where it has become a clear cycle. From elections to courts, from courts to elections, elections back to courts. And so that cycle has not allowed us as government the luxury to focus on governance. And so what we have is primordial politics focus on personal interest, developing narratives that are otherwise not pristine, not based on the needs of your people. The court ordeal itself is a huge distraction. And for one and a half years, you will never, ever, ever feel certain that you're a governor until you are out of the Supreme Court. And that's the situation here. So literally speaking, the first one and a half years, I found myself in a macabre dance. You're never sure where you're going because as you all know in Nigeria, <laughs> you never know when you are out of the court. You know the, the law is not looking out for the truth. It's the fact, and the facts can be constructed. So I am shocked for such an insignificant issue. <laughs> I went all the way from the High Court through the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court, taking one and a half years of my credible time facing unnecessary uh, exposure and stress. But I'm happy that that is all put behind us and I've done a catch-up to be able to find a recovery space for myself. And I'm happy three years down the line. I have a lot to show for the three years in office. Well, before we go to that, uh, one of the things that grabbed headlines in your early days in office was uh, the fact that you were employing so many people uh, in government, in, uh, as advisors and so on, and I was saying, 
or were you just, was it an ego thing or were you just trying to show that you're a people's man by getting all of these people, what jobs are they going to do, you know? Uh, basically, I hold a master's degree in business administration and my core area of specialty is developing economics. In sluggish economies and in very backward circumstances and situations like Nigeria, with excessive population, with youth unemployment hitting the ceiling, any government that understands the sociology and the anthropology of our people will recognize the fact that there is no infrastructure, there is no development program that comes before food on the table. And so the expansion of government creating so many appointments was to allow me an opportunity to reduce the social tension and allow every young cross an opportunity to find food on his, his or her table so that I can focus on the re-engineering and the solution architecture that can construct a new horizon of opportunity for the people. Is that the IAD's version of stomach infrastructure? Um, <laughs> well, here is hands, food on the table, but hands on the floor. So it's actually not stomach infrastructure. It is indeed an opportunity for us all to come together and let's prepare the dish. But to do so, you have to first have something in your stomach to hold yourself. And so today, we have a lot of creative inventions from these same young people that people thought I was just over expanding government. Again, it's also an Ayadeshian theory. It's an advanced college of thought which originates from myself, which is an effort to resolve the conflict between Adam Smith and Keynesian economics. Adam Smith believes that late the forces of demand and supply calibrate price. Keynesian theory thinks that it is completely different to allow things to go uncontrollably because all circumstances are not equal. Therefore, government must calibrate and find a way to intervene. And that's why there are things like paychecks, expansion regimes, and all of that. So there must be a deliberate effort from government to get involved and intervene to create an opportunity for society to survive. That is what explains bailout. That is what explains paychecks. That's what explains all sorts of social packages which runs in conflict with Adam Smith. But to what extent will you take the Keynesian theory before it gets to a point where it becomes cataclysmic? So what I've done is to do a psychedelic and uh, a cladoscopic balance between the Keynesian theory and the Adam Smith theory. And that's where the Ayadeshian theory came in, to moderate the extreme nature of the Adam Smith theory and also to reduce the excessive sociology that characterizes Keynesian theory, which says, look, Yes, government must intervene. Government, in my concept, government must take people during recession, hunger, and pain. Government has to expand to accommodate that pressure that comes with recession. I was sworn in on a recession, so I could see the difficulty. The oil price was nose diving at a very incredible speed. It was very clear that the harbinger of extreme poverty was becoming orgasmic, and if nothing is done, we are going to have a social tension that would degenerate into full-time criminality on the streets. And so the Ayadeshian Choli said, look, why don't you come? I, oh, by the way, Ayadeshian Choli is my self, yes. So <laughs> it's, my, it's my postulation. Yes. And I'm sure I'm going to do that in my PhD, in uh, whatever I choose to do by my second PhD. So I came in to say, look, I need to find a way to get all these young people to work. When they work, as they are working, to earn a living, whether I really need the service or not, it allows me time to focus to create a private sector and industry-driven economy. Cross River State had become too dependent on the federal allocation, and so there was no creativity to find an alternative expression of capacity other than waiting on federal allocation. So the Ayadeshian theory allowed the luxury of the amalgam of all these young people on the dining table, with each person having a, a hole. Now, what has that helped me to do? I realized, under this concept, that once I can create the industries, I can then lease out the industries to professionals, thereby government catalyzing the existence of a private sector. 
they evacuate these excess cells that are taken during recession and evacuate them to the private sector. What have I done, therefore? I have agreed that the forces of demand and supply are critical, but I've also agreed that the intervention of government is critical, but that intervention must be same time sensitive. And so I periodize it in such a way that governments, particularly states and federal governments, have a responsibility to be in business. So if a state is not in business, who would be? If you reserve it for private sector, where is the private sector in cross river state? Where is the private sector in Nigeria? Perhaps we may mention three, four persons. And even those names, they still depend on government patronage. If government was really to operate without uh, providing beacons for escape, you see that they... Like they, they it, exactly. Uh, so you know what I'm saying. Yeah. You see that it would be difficult for them to breathe. So you take the Chinese model, take the Singaporean model. But the, the Chinese have moved from the Mao years and the, the years of um, uh, Deng Xiaoping and so on. They've, they've, they've kind of liberalized. Yeah, but we're just 19 years old. Mm. But they started from here. State-held infrastructure. If you go to China, the biggest corporations today are state-owned. Yeah. China Harbor, state-owned. The biggest uh, harbor construction company in the world. China Railways, state-owned. China Telecoms is state-owned. I, am, I, I cannot understand why Nigeria thinks that, look, when did America have their own private sector? Britain until 1984. They didn't have a private sector. The, uh, the industrial zone that you are developing, uh, you said it's about uh, 5,000 hectares or so. And it's quite, it's quite massive and, and it looks like it has the potential for, for a lot of uh, jobs. Now we had something that your, one of your predecessors, which was Tinapa, it was also touted as um, one of the great innovations of governance at one time. It now lies fallow. Two questions. What is going to happen to Tinapa? The second one, with this massive work you are doing with the Ayade Industrial Park, what signature are you going to put there that will make it outlive your time. So it doesn't end up like a Tinapa. Uh, if I had the luxury of time, I would have asked you first, what is Tinapa? <laughs> because if you understand Tinapa, mm. then it would be easier for me to explain. Mm. Explain. What is Tinapa? It's supposed to be um, the free trade zone. That's it. It's the big free trade zone. Okay. So if from that perspective you look mm. at Napa, mm. we have a free trade zone without really federal government giving it the software that allows it to breed as a free trade zone. It is still illegal for you to uh, operate from Tinapa without being made to pay. They will still shut you down. So the necessary softwares and infrastructure that's required for Tinapa to run as a free trade zone had not been formalized and signed off by federal government. And so when you ship in there, they will still clamp in your goods. You still have to pay the taxes. Uh, until recently that I, I met with the, uh, the new Comptroller General mm -hmm. and he had to send a delegation and we're still working through the process where you cannot ship goods straight into uh, Tinapa. Mm -hmm. uh, that has not been there. Tinapa up to today have not been connected to national grid. Tinapa today is dealing with the issues of they don't have uh, a, 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 even a key wall to land. So if you're a free trade zone and you're supposed to receive goods at no cost, you don't have power, you don't even have a landing bay, it becomes more, far more difficult for it to take off. The cost of Tinapa to really kickstart in the spirit and in good intention of uh, the former governor uh, it's so huge that the cumulative cost of building Tinapa and the attendant loans that came with it, it's almost crippling the energy that is required to get it back to life. We are talking about the sociology of Tinapa. And you, yes. cannot get, you cannot do well operate Tinapa in the way it was conceived. You know, when the environment itself did not have enough um, economic heft to support it. I thought they wanted to support it 
with a lot of, uh, like the Dubai, like um, tourism, like we have to have people pouring in and, and not necessarily the indigents or the, the residents around are supposed to make it what they wanted it to be, but to, to gain a lot of heft from people who are coming from outside to help the economy. Um, again, it will take a full day to simply explain to you why Dubai is a success story. Yeah. Dubai is at the Middle East. The real center of manufacturing today is in the Far East. The consumption is in Africa eh? and Europe. So Dubai is in between the West and the Far East. And at the Middle, as Middle East, it serves as a transshipment point. Even if you look at your air travels, if I am going to US, I'm actually much more comfortable to go with Emirates from here and get to Dubai, spend a day or two, break it there, and use an A380 and fly to the US. And so there are other factors other than going to go and shop that takes me to Dubai. Dubai also did some social liberalization that allows people from Bahrain, from Saudi, who come from very strict religious settings and to ventilate when they get into Dubai yeah. and come back and wear on their jeans and T-shirts and feel human. Like other people. Exactly. <laughs> and so some of those intricacies that if you don't understand, you just think it's a big, complex, beautiful shopping mall. No, it's not a beautiful shopping mall. But trust me, with the pot that they built, with the duty-free status of Dubai, right. it became easier for a man who is manufacturing out of China to now have a base in Dubai, so that the man coming from extreme west or Africa will stop in Dubai and shop. That is not the case. The name Nigeria is not the first choice for a man who wants to transit. Can you even imagine a flight from, uh, from Washington, D.C., going to South Africa, stops over in Ghana, not Nigeria. So there's a mentality, so there is an international perception of Nigeria. That factor was not computed in the calculus of the viability of Tinapa. There are so many factors I can list. Yeah. Remus, you agree with me what? that it was conceptually deficient? No, no I, think, I think if that same Tinapa mm. was situated in Lagos, it would have been a success. Because the first thing in tourism is local purchase power. If you go to Disney World in Kissimmee in, the, in, in Florida, Anaheim. Americans flood there. Yeah. Americans don't care if there is a Paris Disney. They're just fine flying from um, Houston and go to Florida for uh, their holiday. Nigerians would rather shop in London at a higher price than shop for the same good and say, I bought it in Calabar. So there is an Just inferiority. like the Chinese also do. They prefer to go to Paris, to buy yes. Louis Vuitton, yes. and to buy it and in to buy Beijing. And to buy the Louis Vuitton in Beijing. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we have this uh, third world mentality, first generation uh, inferiority complex. That's why I, I, I still once more say, I understand um, the, the glitterazy of Tinapa is healthy enough. So what do I do? Do I allow all of that to run to waste? No. And that's why I fought very hard to get the formal approval from Colonel um, Amid, who is the Controller General of Customs, who sent a delegation here and made sure that he tidied us up. Today we can ship into uh, Tinapa. We have big emporia there that are looking for people to take, uh, to, for us to lease out. But seeing the difficulty in getting uh, patronage for Tinapa, uh, even now that I've actually finally approved a contract to link up Tinapa for the first time in history to national grid, it is obvious that it will still be difficult to have a lot of traffic to cross River State at this time. So what is the wise thing to do? Either turn into medical center of excellence or into a first class university. And that is in the offering, which is part of why I was traveling across the globe looking for educational partnership to be able to bring full value. There's a team which is in town today. Tomorrow, they are going with the deputy governor to inspect 
uh, Tinapa for conversion into a university of advanced research and of advanced value. That's possibly the one way, but it has come with its own pain. Now talk about Ayade Industrial Park. Now you have very fascinating this is your your rice um, um, structure there with the fact that you will be seeding, there will be seedling, and and itself is going to be a counter narrative to what we have in Nigeria, where a lot of the rice does not have nutrients. They cannot. What just is going to contain and restore the nutrients that can make our rice not just a matter of just filling the stomach with empty things, and then you are going to do that by even importing, exporting for foreign exchange, as you said, uh, a way of trying to not depend on national, um, the, the, the handout from, from the federal government every month. Now, with all of this you are putting, how are you sure this thing is going to be institutionally viable and also sustainable even after you are out of office? Uh, definitely, it's a very tough one. It's a cash-22 situation. But let me just help you to make it a lot easier. Nigerians have a mentality set. You build a garment factory, 100% state-owned. If you sell it, you've stolen government money. If you keep it, by the time you leave office, your successor may not have the same steam I may not give it the same attention. Over time, it undergoes atrophy, senescence, and it dies off. And so the most reasonable thing to do to balance between your name, integrity, and sustain the business is to evacuate each of the businesses that I have set up that has found stability, evacuate it into to the full technical professional operators. Luckily, because I'm wise enough, I started my government by starting with my major projects. Contrary to the opinion that one would have thought that I should have been more focused on rural roads, rural electrification, rural water supply, and that's what the people will feel in order that I get re-elected. And I said, no, I am not a politician in that traditional sense of it. I am looking at how to bring value. So if I have started with all of those projects and they have all matured, 12 factories maturing in my first term, I have a full time to nurse them to full independence. And by the time they are fully ripe and now making profit, that time, Crossover State will now divest and take, recover their money, work out, and you would have created a private sector. But government would have initiated, invested, and set it up to that level. So phase one, today, we have a company out of Atul, out of uh, India, that's interested in taking over the garment factory. And when they take it, they run in on a model where we have a percentage sharing. And I'm watching them and I'm setting a target. This is how much you are to deliver to the state government. And if that starts to work, it's already independent of cross the state government mm. under my watch. So it will mature out and become self-sustaining. Look at the rice uh, seedling plant. Uh, last year alone, Central Bank spent close to 70 billion on rice inputs under the rice uh, uh, anchor borers program. Today, Crossover State have set up the first well-certified seedling center in Nigeria and indeed Africa. So any, if the federal government is really sincere and committed to agriculture, the investment I've put here will require that more than 50% of all that fund spent on procurement of seedlings and seeds for rice will now come from here. That is over 40 billion. That is more than, that is almost my, uh, how many years allocation? Your allocation is two billion every month, about. Oh, uh, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. there about. Mm -hmm. When you t t so tell me, how can two billion do all of this? So tell us, how have you been? You, you have answered it earlier that you do some kind of arrangement, uh, you know, um, with people who can, who can invest to come and invest 
But that does not really explain enough how you get two billion virtually every month. You are paying debt on Tinapa. Let, let me just 1. help you. 5. Let me just help you. Um, Africans must come to an end with this their continuous dependence on money. Naira and Kobo has never solved any problem. Just like when I listen to government talk about foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment cannot take a country out of the woods. No foreigner comes to invest for the prosperity of your nation. He only comes to extort. The true value you bring is when you close your doors and focus and bring in your intellect and bring out the best out of your country. Isolationism. Strong. That's strong. <laughs> Often. That's, 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 that's the model that has worked for China. That's the model that has worked for Singapore. I don't know. The Asian Tigers. That's yeah. the model. I don't know why Nigeria will continue to say, let's... <laughs> why would you have our currency running at 369 to a dollar? When the factors that govern our exchange rate are not domestically controlled, they are, within, they are not within our control. It's the price of oil in international market space, basically, which is not a function of the internal economy of Nigeria. Uh, so that's why countries like Malta, small countries, they put an irreversible, irrevocable conversion rate between their currency and the US as law. Because in economics, if you say, let the forces of demand and supply determine the value of your local currency, you have no forces, you have no control on how to regulate other factors on that consideration. And so if you take UK, for example, there's a deliberate policy to make sure that the pound remains a very superior currency. But the Kuwaiti currency is much stronger than the, the pound. What do they export out of Kuwait? Nothing. The, the whole of... Uh, um, so I, I, I don't see how Nigeria cannot one day sit and say, sorry, our main source of foreign exchange earning is from oil today, and I'm sure that will be so for the next eight years. If that is so, this is the time for us to strengthen the value of our local currency. By the way, if you are an investor, would you rather want to come and invest in an economy where you have a tissue paper called Naira? Or you rather want to go to where the exchange rate between that currency and the dollar is strong? So that once you make money from there, it means a lot of money out there. And I've had this discussion severally, and I think the president uh, agrees with me very strongly that the Naira didn't need to be devalued. It, it didn't need to. So Crossover is focusing on massive production of rice seeds and seedlings, including provision of agricultural services, tractorization, land clearing, land preparation, planting and harvesting from Crossover Agri Development Company, CATCO, another SPV, standalone providing agricultural support services. You look at the pharmaceutical factory producing vaccines, drugs, tablets and capsules, including syrups and what have you, focusing on the entire Niger Delta. Today, there's no pharmaceutical company in the whole of the Niger Delta. We've got one standing today. And, and I'm just discussing only the factories you've seen. Yeah. We are putting a chocolate plant. The main cocoa processing plant is in Ecom, yeah. being built by Biola, which is the number one, the Rolls Royce in the food processing industry. The vitaminized rice plant is being built in Ogoja. And today, if you go to Ekori, in Yako, you have our toothpick factory. If you go to Akankwa here, you have our piles and pylon factory. And then the, the poultry farms coming up in Obubra. Yeah. And then you have the, uh, our own uh, Kalavita, which is our own instant noodles coming up. And then you have Kalatika, which is our own frozen chicken coming in massively. Now, what have I done? I have focused on food. Have you stopped and asked yourself? The world st estimates that Nigeria will be the third largest country by 2050. By 2025, Nigeria is, will be hitting, by estimation, Nigeria will be hitting close to 300 million. We are not going to have an expanded landmass. Vertical farming is still uh, strange to us. Nobody is looking at food. There is a research work done by Cavenco of Spain that shows that in Nigeria, 
West Africa, Africa as a whole, Sub-Saharan Africa, the protein deficiency is so huge that it will take thousands and thousands of factories to come in here to find ways of creating protein need. So we took yellow maize cultivation in partnership with a company out of South Africa. And we're talking to American embassy, you can see their consular here with me this afternoon, to see how we can deal with some companies out of the US for the cultivation of grains. So just come back in two months when we are commissioning those plants. You will see what you're going to experience. There is no way those businesses will not thrive. We have an order for $12 million of uh, cocoa, cocoa, crossover cocoa, because our cocoa is organic. I have just put an organic fertilizer production plant. I showed it to you. So all of this on the superhighway route, the whole intention is that we earn our dollar without looking at oil. You can see that the industrial park, you saw the German group, FEE, mm -hmm. building the big power plants that will supply all the energy for the industrial oh, park. Yeah. And that's why we are using this opportunity to tell the entire country and indeed the world that if you have a piece of land in the Ayade Industrial Park, which is off the superhighway, 15 minutes to the deep, proposed deep sea port and 4 minutes to the airport, you have no electricity bills to pay because the power is 100% solar with a 2 megawatts backup cadmium uh, lithium battery. So you have 24 hours electricity. You will not pay a dime. You have no problems. You have no issues with diesel. Come take the land once you can set industries and create jobs. We are a population of about 4 million people yeah. with over 65% of active young people under the age of 35. It is cataclysmic for me to focus on putting roads rural roads, rural electricity, when there will never be light, when the roads will run out in six months, and when there's hunger. So I'd rather put factories and industries that create immediate jobs. You were in the garment factory, yeah. almost 3,000 workers. You are in the rice, almost 5,000 workers. You can see in a short while, I have created a job bank of almost 10,000 people within the small enclave that are not depending on government for survival. Even if government will allow them some leverage and provide them a shoulder to lean on, until they find their feet. And I've got five years to nurture it to maturity. You are, you are saying, by saying that you have five years, you are saying that uh, your re-election is a technicality. No, it's a, give, it's a given. You can feel the pulse in the atmosphere. You can, you can feel it. If you're not doing well, you're not doing well. This is a state that has never owed salary. This is a state that since I came in, I'm not owing pension. I've just authorized the payment of 2014 gratuity. Not pension. You just paid May salary on May 1st. May 1st. And After paying the uh, April in. salary. Exactly. And, and you know, people forget, they say Paris Club. We operated as government for 17 months before the first Paris Club money. In that 17 months, I never owed one day. I have never paid salary beyond 25th of the month. Even when we get zero allocation. Check the records. There are times cross us, they get zero allocation. There are times, there, there was a month I saw our location, 800 million, and I see another state for the month that I'm getting 800 million, another state is getting 12, 15, 16 billion. If I tell you the story of crossover income, you would certainly think I'm, I'm mad for the kind of projects. You know, because people take every project from the perspective of money, money, money. Please, let's let money rest. Use your brain for some time. You, be, you, you see the superiority of the intellect over the muzzle. Money is too, I, I, and I don't know where it's coming from. Everything is about money. And so the black man is adrift in chaos. And so there is no stability of character because the focus and issues of values are accentuated and celebrated around money. So tell me, if Badon Lagos Expressway, its dualization started under Obasanjo regime. Today, uh, uh, I, I, I hear that uh, President Boy has just released money for the contractor to remobilize to site. That's about 97 to 103 kilometers project. Yeah. I am doing 148 kilometers dualization in my regime. When I announced it, it looks like it was impossible. I'm 80% complete. I'm done with the earthworks. Asphalting is just commencing. 
Yeah, That's, yeah, yeah. It's awarded for 31 billion. The other job was 67 billion. That's the, that's the capacity of intellectual engineering. And if you ask Cross River State if they have 31 billion, again, it's a subject for you to come for a lecture <laughs> on how you're commoditizing the intellect and bringing value to the table. How can you be paying salaries of thousands of appointees without owing a bank? In the first instance, Cross River cannot borrow. Because DMO, Debt Management Office, will tell you Cross River State is over indebted to be able to borrow. So from day one. Because you are paying money every month, like 1.5 billion. Yes, out of 1.5 billion, billion is just what you would see. They are standing, irrevocable standing payment orders. There are things like College of Education, uh, things like Cross River State University of Science and Technology, uh, ITM, so many other institutional salaries that do not fall in the traditional civil service structure that comes upon my shoulders every month. But I thank God he has given me the grace that as I'm seated here, I'm not owing, and I'm not owing salaries, I'm not owing pension. Gratuities, I'm paying on as it goes. But again, it is the grace of God, but more importantly, the zeal, the commitment, the understanding that every cross -Iberian knows that before I became governor, I was known and, and I'm known for my personal wealth, from independent hard work, from selling my intellect, from being a consultant in the oil and gas industry, I rose to my own fame. And so I believe that it is the application of that experience and knowledge that have brought it into full utility. And that's why in Cross River State, if I ask them if I should pay salary now, they will say no. I, and that is to me my highest selling point, that my people trust me so much that they tell me, well, in other states, people are protesting and rioting for lack of salaries. Cross River, you have people protesting that the salary is coming too early and that they're eating off their money. And I, and I take it with grim resignation, with great excitement and glory to God for allowing me the ingenuity to create that opportunity to be able to pay salary effortless. In fact, my, 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 my citizens tell me that I have commonized salary. This thing that is a big issue, it's no issue in Cross River. Please allow me an opportunity to mention that Cross River State has written to the federal government to say, when I came into office, because the oil and gas is my core background, I partnered with a company out of Ukraine and Russia and did a deep vision search over the Cross River State land space. And I've identified all the areas with hydrocarbon deposits. Mm. I am, my letters and applications, the reports and every document is before Mr. President, seeking and pleading with the federal government to allow us a discretional license to be able to Prospect. explore. We've done the prospecting to be able to do the full exploration getting to advanced seismic and 3D and finalizing with extraction so that we can indeed produce our own crude oil. Mm. Uh, that is still waiting. I am also still waiting for the formal and final approval for the construction of the deep sea port. Now, I'd like you to use this platform to express to federal government that traditionally, politicians focus on only low-hanging fruits just to be able to win the election. And you have a governor who is thinking deep and looking into the gaze into the future. And because my opening remarks when I was being sworn in, that I will never let a cross go to bed hungry on account of poverty. If a cross must sweat, he should not sweat out of toil, but out of pleasure. He should sweat say he's exercising, not because he's tilting, tilting so hard to be able to earn a living. Okay, on that uh, very hopeful note, uh, I end this uh, very interesting conversation with the governor of Cross River, Professor Ayade. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you so much. That is the program this week on the platform, which returns next week. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. My handle is 
at Sam Omashae. Also visit my website to read my columns at www.samomashae.com. And until next week, be good. <laughs>